I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and uh, welcome to the Attleboro School Committee meeting of Monday, February 5th. Uh, this is your notice that the meeting is being electronically recorded. Uh, we are going to start tonight with a spotlight event from Brennan Middle School and for that I will turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Regan. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Geddes. Uh, so tonight we welcome Acting Principal Julie O'Boyle and staff and students from Brennan Middle School. They are going to talk about their engagement with our community, specifically our local veterans, um, and the partnership they have built with them over the past several years. So to get us started this evening, I'd like to welcome Ms. O'Boyle to the podium. Hi. So as she said, I'm Julia O'Boyle, acting principal at Brennan Middle School. And when I came to Brennan last year, it was wonderful to become part of a team that has worked to develop a community connection with local veterans through the VFW. For more than a decade, Brennan has held a breakfast with veterans, and more recently, students have participated in Patriot's Pen. Joining me tonight are teachers Melissa Shackney, Katie Nolan, and Shannon Vitek. Also, we have students Isabella Aquino, Valentina Capo, and Riley Bennett. If you'd like to come up. Good evening, school committee. I'm Mrs. Shackney. And uh, I started the Veterans Day breakfast. I was trying to think of when this began. And um, my earliest camera roll pictures of this were back in 2015. So somewhere around that time. Um, and it was just a probably just a brainchild of wanting to do something for the veterans and then having the kids kind of probably engage with me and say, what do you want to do? Um, maybe we could host like a donut party. And then it turned into what it is today. Um, and so we're going to show you some pictures. We're going to hear from some of the students. Um, and this is a whole student-centered event where we cook. Um, we bring in the, the students themselves cook, bring in the food items, uh, make the decorations, make, the, make cards, thank you cards. Um, and we reach out to the local VFW and we reach out to uh, our students, veterans, and their families and invite them to come. Um, so it's... So phase one, thank you for having <laughs> us and allowing our amazing super students to be here today to share with you what it means to be a part of such an incredible event, being able to honor and serve those who have served our country. And really, the whole rollout of it um, stems from our VFW and the Patriots pen that they initiate every single year for students 6 through 12 to participate in and their theme for the year becomes the theme for our breakfast and so we start with the lessons to get everybody um, prepared for this the background of veterans day what it means to be a veteran and we bring in a veteran panel and this year did we have nine maybe nine of you that all came and spoke to our students and made that connection personally that then helped them to write the essays and know what it means. And so tonight you guys are gonna be blessed with Izzy Kino, who is going to share not only the Attleboro Post winning essay, but it also got forwarded on to the district level where she took second in district for her essay. So she's joined us tonight to actually share her essay with you. Um, the best way to predict the future is to create it. A quote from Abraham Lincoln, he inspires me every day. Do you know what else inspires me? Our country, the freedom we have. Um, we can express how we truly feel and we all have equal rights. The freedom we all have, all the soldiers who fought for our rights, I'm inspired by them. Their strength, their power, and their determination. That is the reason we have freedom. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have our freedom. I'm inspired that they had the courage to fight for our continued freedom. Our freedom of speech gives us the right to show how we feel. I can express my feelings. If I'm not happy with the president, I can express that. If I think the president is amazing, I can express that. You don't have that right in other countries. That's what makes our country amazing. If our military did not fight for this right, we wouldn't be able to express how we feel. This is inspiring. The people who fought for our rights got us to a point where people of all genders and races have equal rights. 
All the people who fought for our rights, the soldiers who went into battle and died fighting for the U.S.'s independence. This is why I believe that the veterans are amazing and I am inspired by that. My favorite president, Abraham Lincoln, grew up poor but had books. He managed to gain an education without going to school. He was determined, hardworking, and kind. He was determined enough to become president, and when he came, became president, he fought to abolish slavery. I am truly inspired by him and his power and determination to change our country. Our country just proves that anything is possible. The freedom we have from the people who fought for it. Everyone who helped get it to this point is so admirable and wonderful. Where our country is, the hardships we face, the people we lost. In conclusion, this country be is a beacon of hope that people need to believe in because of our freedom. The fact that we can express how we truly feel and how we all have equal rights, that inspires me. I am thankful for the people that died fighting for us. If they didn't fight, we wouldn't be here. That's why everyone that can contributed to this country's freedom is amazing. The real story of this project is student voice and choice. Our students, after writing their amazing essays and also after meeting with our community members, sat down and chose a group or a crew, as we call them, to participate in. Every student, 180 of them, participated in this. So our, our crews were cooking, so they made the meal and served it, creating decorations. So all of the pictures that you see, the banners, the paper chains, the poppies, were all made by students. <coughs> all of the photos that you're going to see this evening, or the majority of them, are taken by our students in our technology crew. And we have our MC of our ceremony here as well tonight. So I'm going to welcome Valentina and Riley to come speak about their experiences. I'm sure. I'll talk first. So uh, I worked on crew. To, uh, my crews were tech and speeches. So for tech, I got to take videos of everyone working together. And I got to experience all the different crews and see how like when one person does something, it's it's a gesture and it's nice. But when everyone comes together, they can make something really cool and they can. We change the cafeteria and we make veterans feel good. I mean, some of them they loved walking in and seeing like everyone clapping for them and cheering for them, and really appreciating like all of the work that they've done. And f speeches, I got to talk in front of everyone and just show my appreciation for um, all the work they put in. And after that, I got to talk to one really nice lady, and she was telling me about all of her experiences and her crazy stories in the military. And it was just really inspiring, all the work that she put in. And I, go I got to thank her, and the friends I was sitting with thanked her. And it just really sh like made us feel good to show our appreciation and do that nice gesture for them. So. I, um, I was the MC, and I remember when they first talked about the veterans breakfast I like had this little like image in my head I was like oh I want to like kind of talk in front of all of them because I want to sh I just want to show my appreciation th for them so bad having um, family members who are veterans now and it was just really inspiring so when I got to write my little email to Ms. VTech about why I really wanted to be the MC it almost came like super easy to me because I was just like I wanted to show my appreciation for them so bad and I wanted to like let them know that they were seen and it was so heartwarming standing at like the standing on top of the stage and just like looking out at all of them and seeing them all just like look up at us and like with the looks of just like I don't know it was just so like heartwarming the way they all just like looked up at us and were like so appreciative of like the care that we showed them and um I was serving people food as well and I was just everywhere helping around and I got to help I got to talk to a couple people and it was like nice just hearing them like give thanks and be like thank you like this helped I wouldn't say helped but more so um this like made me feel like I did something because a lot of them have just been kind of like overlooked eventually and it's nice to like keep giving them like a light to show them how like much they've actually done for us and how their fighting for us have impacted like the country so much and especially this generation now.
Do you, do you guys have any questions for the kids? Or, or general comments? I, I, I don't know if it's so much questions as just, um, just pride. I mean, five years ago almost now, we, um, we had the Vietnam moving wall here. And the one thing I, my job on that committee was to make sure we brought kids to the wall, whoever needed, whoever wanted to be there. What I remember, first and foremost, and all of you were probably, you weren't there yet. You weren't at Brennan yet. Uh, many, you know, but Brennan sent everybody. Um, Logistics played a part, right? But so did you, Melissa. So, at, at Our BFW Teacher of the Year. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm just. We love these connections. <laughs> yeah, I, I do about that one. I didn't know if if um, Jerry and the and the the vets were gonna bring that one up, but congratulations. Um, and, and just a great way to connect two amazing organizations, two amazing groups in our community. And the one thing I just wanted to mention from our MC, um, they were seen. Like, I'm going to remember that the whole rest of the night because I think that that's very important. And thank you for touching on that. Mr. Storrs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as the school committee's resident veteran, I want to thank all of you. Um, something I've noticed about Attleboro since I moved here is how much veterans are appreciated, from the moving wall to the Veterans Day activities to all the things that you guys do. It, it really means a lot, so thank you. And we also had um, Jerry Lynch, who has been very, very active um, in helping with the connection to Brennan. Uh, and we also have a little something here. Yeah. Uh, it's a video. It's a video. It's a video. It's a video. Sorry, yeah. 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 We got you. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank the students of uh, Brennan Middle School for having us at their breakfast, walking through the doors, and having our young people at the school welcome us. What that has done for us, all of our veterans, is we feel that at least now um, people are remembering and people are giving us what we need for support. Um, that breakfast is tremendous. We get to talk to young people. And you're the ones that we really want to talk to. Okay? Um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of the veterans in our post, post 312, post 20, that, and all of those other veterans that go even though they're not members of our post and again we welcome all of you to come and visit our post 122 park street and um your teacher has a has my number so if anybody would like to come over to see the post i need a phone phone call and i'll be right there for you and the letters that they wrote you said oh my they god went. the letters that you wrote um, I mentioned tonight in a meeting that the State Command Sergeant Major for the Mass Army National Guard has three units that are deployed. All of those letters are going to those deployed soldiers. I know that one of the, one of the units is on the border and the other two, I couldn't, they couldn't tell me where they are but they are getting your letters. And hopefully soon you should be hearing something about it. Thank you so much. So in conclusion, I'd like to say thank you to Brennan's staff and students for being here, but also a very big thank you to Jerry Lynch, Joe Murphy, and all the other local veterans, who not just for being here tonight, but also for their ongoing support of the entire Brennan community, and also for your many years of service. Any other uh, thoughts or questions from the committee? Uh, I will say, having spoken to uh, Mr. Lynch about this at the uh, Patriots Pen Night, um, uh, I know how much this meant to him and uh, 
to everyone in the post, so thank you all very much. Um, and keep up the great work. Um, it, it really does mean a lot to, to our community, so thank you. Thank you. The uh, next item on our agenda is our uh, Student Advisory Council update. Uh, so I will turn it over to all three members that have joined us tonight. Welcome. <laughs> uh, so this time I do actually have something for you guys. So I have in front of me an email from Mr. Gay, who is the CTE director. And it is an email about our robotics club. Last month, our robotics club competed at WPI, which, if you don't know, is a very strong leading college university, or institute, I should say, in engineering, which robotics happens to fall in. So previously this year, I did not know much about the robotics club at all. I knew it was a thing, but that was pretty much it with most clubs that you don't interact with. And one of those members, who I would imagine is the leader of the club, came here and was presented with an award. And I knew him, but we weren't too close. But we became good friends after. So I stopped in at the table at Blue Pride Night, and they showed me the full works of the robots. There's the build team, the program team, the design team. You think that you can't be you know, somebody who works on robots. You can be. You don't need to be good at designing or coding. There's, there's always something for you. There's guys who I know who just go to talk to people, and they put a few screws in. And there's guys I know who are putting in world-class coding effort. Like I have no idea how they know this this young. But um, they competed, and this was their first competition since the pandemic. So I don't know exactly how many years, but it feels like a million years since then. But that's a very major thing. So they placed 20th, and it took them multiple, multiple months this year to be working crazy hard to push through. Now, I'm not exactly sure how many people competed at this event, but when I was scrolling through WPI's list of, um, they're called First Tech Challenges, there are hundreds of teams that compete at certain of these events, sometimes even in the thousands. I'm not sure how many for this one exactly, but considering it's their first one in multiple years, this is basically a completely new team because nobody's here you know, as a senior during the pandemic. That's incredible. Placing anywhere, doing it at all, just tackling the challenge is incredible. What I've heard already, what I've gotten from this email, they've already begun immediate preparation for their next challenge. I believe it's going to be held at WPI as well, where they're already saying, or this is what they told me, this is a truly strong showing for a foundational year for our club. We're already planning, and it's already underway for us to compete again at our next first challenge. So, like I said, I'm not a professional you know, robotics guy, but it inspires in me at the very least, to see a club that hasn't competed for a while come back and do something great. Because I know if it was a table of us, we want to place 20th there. So congratulations to them. I'll turn it over to either Carla or whoever wants to take it. Yeah, I got it. So this past weekend was pretty exciting for Attleboro Athletics. Um, we Starting off, we had our girls and boys Hockamock League um, championship meets. Um, the boys who swim on Friday night, they end up winning their meet, which is the first time that's happened since joining the Hockamock League in 2011. And this is their second year going undefeated in the Kelly Rex. So, and there were a couple Hockamock records broken um, uh, in the 200 medley relay, which was also a high school record as well, and the 400 freestyle relay, which was a record broken by six seconds. So, and they won three separate individual races as well, so the boys had such a great night. And for the girls, um, we ended up coming in second overall and to, well, to Franklin High School. Uh, we had a couple school records in that, in the 100 free and 200 medley. And of the four meet records broken that day, uh, three of them were from Atterboro. And we had- Some of them were from this table. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we had the Hawk records broken in the 200 medley relay, the 100 free, and the 100 back. And also for girls gymnastics, similar to the boys, they won their Hawk Mock Kelly Rex championships for the first time ever this week. Yeah, off to Carla. Okay, so our little update started in January. Um, our club, BSA, Black Student Alliance, as you may know, they planned a Martha Luther King March on the 16th of January, and it was greatly successful. Um, students and staff alike, even in cold, freezing weathers, we were out there marching for one of the best causes out there. Like, 
it was it was great. Unity, like pride, everything was out there. Um, and actually, currently coming up, there will be a BSA Renaissance showing even more pride and unity between AHS students from all across the world and staff. Um, also, on top of that, um, with that renaissance, there will be a, um, a poetry night almost. like, And that's going to be on Friday, I want to say, of this coming week. There's going to be poetry, refreshments. It's like... Um, almost like a de-stressor for your week. So I really hope to see many faces there. And yeah, I think that's our recap. Uh, do you know what time the event is on Friday night? It starts at four to six. And that's here at the high school? Yes, at the Bistro. Any other questions? I meant to hand these around when I was talking about them, but Ms. Campbell nicely printed out these tons of pictures of the... Uh, I was actually Mr. Gay. Mr. Gay printed out tons of these <laughs> pictures. Ms. Campbell gave them to me. So at the robotics competition. So if you guys want to pass them around and take a look. Excellent. And congratulations to all the athletes both present here tonight and uh, at home. Okay. Um, it was entertaining watching Mr. Hool try to continually update social media <laughs> with record after record and championship <laughs> after championship. <laughs> And uh, I will say, just from where I'm sitting, Mr. Larson uh, audibly made a wow to the six seconds difference. That's, that's huge. But six seconds yeah. doesn't sound like a lot, but in a swim race, it, that's, it is a ton. that is demolishing a yeah, record. The boys did so well that night. And, Very happy for them. And at one point, I saw Mr. Domenici running out of ink on his pen trying to make <laughs> notes of all the accomplishments <laughs> that you all were sharing. So, um, so congratulations, and, and thank you all very much. Congratulations, Zuri. I know you were being modest, but we, we know when you were talking about the, the girls' swim meet and records broken that, that you did that. So, job Thank well you. done. Yeah, really. So, the next item on the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Frappier. Question. Uh, do the boys swim or girls' gymnastics move on to a state level competition after this? Um, I know for sure the boys have their sectionals, their north sectionals, sorry, south sectionals this upcoming weekend on Sunday, um, and their state championship that next week on that Sunday. Same for a girls' swim, but on the Saturdays. So I'm not 100% sure with gymnastics, so. But. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? Uh, so uh, next item is our superintendent's report, so I'll turn that over to Mr. <coughs> Sawyer. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> um, first, I have an update and a, a request for action. Um, as you know, earlier this year, uh, we had to uh, cancel school for a single school, Brennan Middle School, uh, due to power outage in the one building. Uh, the rest of the district remained open. Uh, as a matter of uh, state law, we have to make up that day, regrettably. Um, so to get to 180 days. Uh, we've known this, we've been working on what our options were. Uh, we wanted to make sure there weren't other things that we could do to be creative. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of wiggle room to, uh, to, to get out of this other than to make up a day of school, uh, especially uh, at this time of year. So <clears throat> in looking at uh, what our options are and uh, consulting with the educators about uh, how they see things, you know, basically the uh, options on the table would be to, uh, we could schedule a day of school any Saturday we wanted, um, which is not much of a, of a winning idea on, in the minds of many. Um, you could schedule it during one of our vacations, both February uh, and April. Uh, it's obviously too late to try to pull that off for February, but April certainly um, on, the, on the table. Um, you can, we could schedule it as an additional day of school at the end of the school year, so the rest of the district ends on whatever day we end up with, and then Brennan goes for one more day, um, which is in some ways the easiest solution, uh, but I, I was really pleased in the discussion uh, with the AEA that uh, they don't, they see it the way the administration does, which is that uh, that's not going to be a meaningful day of school. Um, you know, it's, it's, a compliance exercise, something that we do have to do someplace, but uh, in terms of being a real day of school, it'd be a bit of a farce uh, to bring uh, students in on that day. 
So we arrived at the conclusion that we think our best option as a district is to schedule uh, this day for Good Friday, uh, March 29th. Um, the day is open. Um, it is available. Uh, it is still in a meaningful part of the academic year. So while we do know that uh, some families, because you know they've made plans, uh, will choose not to, to, to send their kids on that day, the people who do come will actually be able to deliver meaningful uh, learning and, and, and make good use of the time. In um, deference to the fact that a lot of people do have plans because we had scheduled it as not being a day, we are recommending that we just schedule a half day of school, uh, which will allow us to comply with 180 days of school. Um, it also will uh, make this a, a lighter lift for the district because there are lots of employees that don't work at Brennan that'll have to work that day, that weren't planning to work that day uh, to make the school day work. Um, you know, people like in transportation and other departments that um, <clears throat> you know, are affected by this. And so by going with a half day, that uh, I think will make this uh, easier for everybody involved. Um, and again, I, I think a half day at that time of year has value, whereas a full day and some of the other options that we're talking about would not. So I would ask the committee to consider uh, doing that. Now, I mean, technically, we don't normally vote on makeup days, uh, but where this isn't just a snow day that the, we did as a district and it's not just being added to the end of the year, I, I, I would recommend that the committee consider taking action uh, on this proposal tonight. So with that, I'll uh, entertain a motion to open Brennan Middle School for f a half day of school on Friday, March 29th, 2024, to make up the previous closure due to a power outage. So moved. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? <laughs> Mr. Frappier? Sure. Uh, do, <clears throat> is our transportation vendor available on that day? I'm sorry? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, yes, the, uh, have the parents been polled for their preference? Uh, no, we did not. And then I have a second question. Um, do we need to have a certain percentage of students attend in order to make this a makeup day? Okay. There's no threshold, no. Okay, thank you. Mr. Domenici? Uh, thank you. Uh, I was actually curious if Good Friday would be an option. My question is, uh, <clears throat> as far as the teachers, the AEA, is this anything, or powers or anything like that, is, is everybody on board at Brennan? Do we have to... Have, have, is this just for us to recommend and then they we have to go back and hear whether or not so the teachers are on we've, board? Had, we've had conversations with the leadership of all the associations and um, there's buy-in to this being the best option uh, we do have employees who have you know tickets to, to go away that weekend so we're gonna have to work through some issues but we haven't got into the that level of detail yet because we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves um, we wanted to get approval and you know buy in from the committee uh, before we sort those things out. But uh, the of I mean, you know, again, frankly, nobody really wants to, to to have to deal with this. But of all the options, I think begrudgingly we all recognize that this is by far the best one. And so we're going to get the most buy in for this out of the people who have to do it. Yeah, I and I agree with you on that. And I I would imagine most of us here probably would. I don't want to speak for anybody out of turn. It was just a question of like we approve this motion, and we're saying schools open. Yeah, it's so a, just want to make sure up for that the administration. schools open, we're going to have teachers there yeah, yeah. Uh, would, to make this meaningful. So <laughs> hopefully I haven't uh, miscalculated that. Okay. Thank you. So we all hope. Uh, Mr. Bennett? Um, I'm, I'm sure that the answer, uh, that this isn't an option or you would have presented it, but I'm going to ask anyway. W w is there a professional development day that could be swapped out or moved to the end of the calendar or something like that? Full days have already been. And taking a half day and turning it into a full day, if you do that twice, it doesn't count because a half day is already as good as uh, a day. You are not the first person to ask that one. I'm, I'd be disappointed if Somehow I Somehow the state uh, doesn't let that one fly. Okay. No, that's all I wanted to just make sure I understand that there, this really is the only option. Mr. Bowie, did you have I just want to say from like a student perspective on it, I think it's the best way to go. If we are talking realistically, actually getting work done, Nobody's going to work on an extra last day of school, especially middle schoolers. You know, they don't like working in general most of the time. But if it was me and I had to make the decision just for myself and just for my peers, I would absolutely put it a half day somewhere or tack off a day of break, something like that. So I think this is the way to go. An extra day, you know, what they're going to see it as an extra day off summer vacation or it's going to be, oh, we had an extra half day in the school year. I think the kids are going to be happy with it. It's going to come with its hurdles, but I think it's going to be smoother once it's over. 
Appreciate that, Austin. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I, I do agree. It, it is the best of all the awful uh, situations. I do think um, knowing that uh, knowing that a lot of families, not all districts, uh, close for a Good Friday. So um, in some cases, uh, that's that's one way that Attleboro's calendar is somewhat unique. Um, so this is uh, from a from a family perspective, it's one less day of potential child care needs uh, being addressed. So, um, so I, I, I agree with, uh, with, this, with this concept as well. Uh, so we have a motion uh, to uh, open Brennan Middle School for uh, good, the Good Friday holiday, Friday, March 29th, 2024, for a half day to make up the closure from earlier this year. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> while speaking of Brendan, I wanted to give you an update. Uh, tonight we saw the wonderful presentation and uh, appreciate uh, uh, all the work that uh, Acting Principal O'Boyle has done. Um, it's been very difficult to step in uh, with the departure of the principal in September. Uh, she's done admirable work. But um, it's now time for Brennan to focus on finding um, you know, a, a permanent replacement and as we promised at the start, there will be a full public process, uh, and that begins with the formation of a screening committee that will set criteria, put together a posting, and run a process that will produce finalists uh, that, that I will then interview um, and make the final selection, uh, hopefully well in advance of uh, April vacation. So uh, that process is off and running. We're uh, putting together a, a representative group of stakeholders, and uh, that committee will get off and, and running uh, very shortly. Um, questions about that? Uh, speaking of principals, um, as I mentioned in the update, I uh, went to Hill Roberts last week. Uh, they have an interim principal, uh, which is a slightly different situation than acting. And, um, you know, basically Dr. Madden was uh, pressed into service uh, when Mr. Chelman left us in June last year. And, you know, the, the deal there is, okay, we didn't have time to run a process uh, to get somebody in place for July 1. Uh, we'll pick someone who we think would be a good choice, let them audition for their job while they're in it, um, and then revisit that uh, in January. We've done this a couple times um, with, some, with some success. And so the, the key moment is to go back and meet with the people who have been working with this person you know, since, since July and say, okay, you know, you got a real good look at this. Uh, do we want uh, to offer the job to the, the person who's sitting in the chair, or do we want to do a search uh, with the staff understanding that they have that, that choice as the best people who would know whether or not we have the right person in the job or not? And uh, the overwhelming support that Dr. Madden received from that staff was, was really heartwarming. They said such nice things about his work and about the, their feelings about, uh, you know, the promise for the future with, with him at the helm. So. Um, I was relieved, and uh, we have uh, opened up negotiations, and hopefully we'll be able to sign him to a, a long-term deal, which is what the staff wanted um, in short order. So I'll certainly keep uh, both the Hill-Roberts community and the school community uh, raised of any developments on that front. Okay. As uh, you saw in, again, the update and uh, in the paper last week, um, we are very excited about um, our mental health uh, resource and referral helpline interface uh, that we are now doing uh, through a partnership uh, with Attleboro Public Schools, uh, the City of Attleboro, and William James College. I want to personally thank the mayor for her leadership on this, uh, working with our director of family engagement and assistance, uh, Joanne De Palma. The two of them have brought this uh, incredible resource to our city. Um, it is funded uh, in part by the opioid abatement funds and through the generosity of Bristol County Savings Bank. Um, they are supporting it through the schools. You know, one of the things that we've been talking about for a long time and certainly was exasperated by the pandemic is that increasingly we have students who have mental health uh, needs, right? They need supports, they need services, and as I keep explaining, schools are not designed to meet those needs. We are educators, not mental health experts. We are not qualified uh, to provide those supports. Um, it's not what we're geared to do, and it's not what we're qualified to do. What we need to do is to prov 
to be the conduit by which we connect students and their families to these services. And that's something that we've really been looking for and believe that this initiative is going to help significantly with. So um, there's a hotline, there's a resource on the, our website. People can, can um, find the number there. They can find other ways to reach uh, out for resources. But it's also a referral service that we will, when we know that uh, students and families uh, need help, uh, we will connect them and help them to make that call. And then the service is what puts families in touch with the right people. And part of their job is screening so that they understand what the issue is and to connect the right services with the right people. Um, and uh, I, I think it's also really important to note that while you know we're concerned about this for our students, this is available for every resident in the city. So you know, part of helping our students is to help their community. Um, you know, our students come from the community. Uh, many of the problems they face are centered on issues within their families and in with the community. And so this is a community resource, and uh, we're very excited to be able to now have another tool uh, in, in in the toolbox when. We see families struggling that we can help them and get them the help that they need. So this is an exciting moment, and uh, we look forward to uh, what kind of results we're getting from this. <coughs> Any questions? Uh, I will say I, I was able to attend the uh, the kickoff virtually, um, and it, although I wasn't in the room, it did sound like it was a pretty well attended event uh, from a number of city departments. Um, and hearing about how directly. Uh, potential clients are connected to the exact services they need, I think was, uh, was very helpful. Um, the potential for emergency services. So it was, it was, uh, I, I agree. I think it's going to be a, a great resource for the, for the community, but especially for our students if needed. Yeah, no, I mean, to, to be able to move beyond, wow, we really need to provide some help here to now have something to provide to help them, um, is a big step. Okay, <clears throat> my, my last word of business is it comes with a great deal of disappointment. Um, I, I want to talk about FY25, and Mr. Furtado unfortunately had a family emergency um, and had to rush home. So you're left with me to uh, try to talk about budget stuff. I know you would much prefer uh, our good friend, Mr. Furtado. Um, as his memo uh, indicated um, from, uh, over the weekend, um, the bottom line here is, is that uh, our foundation budget came in uh, lower than we both anticipated and hoped. Now, we didn't have a set number in our minds, um, but we did think we were going to get closer to the number um, that we were looking for, the number that is our level service budget. Remember, in, De in December, uh, we had set that number at $103.78 million. Um, so that's, that's what we were hoping for. And while we weren't counting on that number exactly, uh, we were hopeful we were going to get something close to it. Uh, instead, we got $101.97 million, um, which is a delta of just under $2 million. Um, so, you know, uh, the first question we wanted to ask ourselves is, you know, why, why did we miss? Um, what, what exactly happened? Because, um, you know, the, the state has got a, you know, talked about its increase of uh, nearly 5%. So, you know, uh, why didn't we do as well as uh, we would have thought? Um, as indicated in the memo, and uh, Mr. Furtado has been, continues to work on it and had some more uh, information, um, you know, one of, the, one of the keys is uh, certainly we've discovered that uh, the, the reduction in their inflation calculation was at least a piece of this. Um, last year, they used an 8% inflation um, uh, escalator, and this year, it's like 1.25% or something like that. So um, that's, that's a significant difference uh, that helps to explain some of this. Um, but it's still perplexing because uh, our enrollment went up. Now, not as much as uh, we thought it went up, so we are digging into the reporting side of things to try to understand um, why... The number that they used is different than the number we thought we were going to see. So there is a discrepancy there that we're still trying to, to uncover. Um, but the, the, the thing that's, that's perplexing is, is that our enrollment went up and went up enough that there should have, that should have been, a, well, it wasn't, shouldn't be, it helped us, right? Without that increase in enrollment, things would be uh, much worse. Um, we also saw a bump 
in, um, from CTE enrollment going up, right? So of the $2.5 million that our foundation budget went up uh, for FY25, 1.7 million of it is attributable to both the increase in enrollment and the increase in CTE enrollment, right? That's like all but $800,000 of it. So if we did not have those increases in enrollment, if our CTE numbers hadn't gone up, if our total student number hadn't gone up, we would be facing an increase of only $800,000. Um, so, and then SOA is fully implemented. So we don't know, it's hard to figure out exactly how much SOA money, it's not like it's a line that you can like point to and say, okay, that's our SOA money. But that's roughly what SOA is. So when you put that into the equation, what you're finding is, is that really the increase from last year to this year is, is virtually zero if you take out SOA, um, C, or CTE enrollment, and student enrollment. So um, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So Mark's been calling around our local communities to ask what they're getting. And uh, right in line with the assumptions that I just outlined, Many of our, our, our neighboring communities are looking at number, foundation numbers that are next to zero over, over FY24, FY24 by $100,000, less than $100,000. And some communities are actually seeing a reduction in foundation budget from 24 to 25. So uh, there's a significant number of communities, it turns out, that are getting close to zero. Um, which is exactly what we would be getting if we didn't qualify for SOA and if we didn't have these increases. So um, the silver lining in all of this is that this our situation could be much more dire than it is. Um, and with uh, where we are and with uh, various factors, um, there's in this moment uh, no reason um, to ring any alarm bells. We haven't even sat down with the city yet to hear their perspective on um, what they're going to be able to do, and we haven't talked about what numbers we're using for the, uh, you know, the, the, the deductions they take uh, from their side. So um, there's a lot still to go, and uh, we remain optimistic that while this news means that we're not going to be in a position to do additional things next year, that bet just that's basically wiped off the table. Um, we do believe that we're going to be able to deliver. Um, continued educational services at the level that we have uh, based on our ability to handle these things in some creative ways. So that's really where the work begins. Um, we have from now until our budget presentation in April. Uh, we'll keep you updated with uh, what we're getting from the city as we have to sit down with them and get some in-depth conversations. And then we'll have our budget presentation around the 1st of April. Um, and between here and there, we'll map out a way for how we're going to make this work. But we wanted to give you a little bit of context of what the numbers are telling us and where, why we think we landed where we did. Any initial questions or comments? Um, the, uh, my big question, in, in the memo that we received, uh, Mr. Furtado mentions the FY24 credit number at 900,000 and the commitment above, the commitment of funding above net school spending for uh, from FY24 being 1.6. So it sounds like, although you haven't met with the city, that 2.5 is still where we're anticipating, or? 2.5? plus. Sorry, I'm, I'm adding the 900,000 and the 1.6. So the 900,000 is comes, included? Co it's, a reduction. Goes, it's a reduction. OK, I'm sorry. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Yeah, so they, they take. Credits, and that's a number that moves around based on various factors. So, um, you know, we're, we're, that's still yet to be determined. But that's that's the number for this year. So that number comes off of, you know, uh, one hundred one nine six six. You know, subtract nine hundred from that, and we're really talking one hundred one zero six six. Yep. Right. But then other things get added to it. Right. So whatever the city adds above net school spending would be then added to that number. Got it. Right. And also in play would be, you know, usually the city um, gives back unexpended funds. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, 
How much is that going to be? How much of that are they going to return? How can we use that creatively? So there, there are some avenues here, which is why um, you know, we don't think that this situation is um, as bad as what we're hearing other people are facing in, in, in other places. Um, but the general picture of like where the state landed is, is really hard to get our heads around. Um, you know, how, how communities are supposed to um, keep up uh, with what we were asked to do with uh, these kinds of increases is, is uh, ludicrous. Mr. Domenici. Uh, thank you. So looking at like what was a, what was provided to us was an Excel spreadsheet, and you kind of answered the question a little bit because it, it listed in here that nine hundred thousand dollars city credit drops the net school spending down, but then the expected end of year surplus, and I guess we're in a position this year where it's a little bit inflated based upon ESSER funds, and but it looks like that'll offset each other if based upon what I'm assuming is Mark's calculation of having about a million dollars end of year surplus and with the assumption that the city will, as they've done previously, give that back. It puts us just below what we thought we would need for level services, but within a fraction. Um, the, so so I, I agree with you that, you know, level services is attainable. Attainable. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the message um, from Mark, it says the two main drivers of the reduced Chapter 70 funding were enrollment, where the October 2022 census increase turned out to be less than expected. Is that really 22? Or I, I figured 23, we, we would know what 23's number is because October 1st is the year. Are we, are we always that far behind, like a year behind? That's what he says. Okay, because... I always have that same reaction, but... Yeah, because I, I wondered if it was a typo and if it oh, was intended gosh. to be October 2023 because I feel like this year... We had significantly more enrollment. Um, so that's, apparently that doesn't that, get factored in. That's part of what we're digging into is, is yeah. um, there's some hope for next year that because we've had a bump since then, that we're going to see another bump, which I, I, I want to make very clear. We're very special in that that's the trend here in Attleboro. I mean, most of the Commonwealth has their enrollment numbers going the other way. <clears throat> Uh, they, before the pandemic, it was headed in that direction because the, the, the total stool, student enrollment in the state is going down. Um, but, you know, with all the missing children from, from the pandemic, uh, I mean, that we go up um, is really sailing into the wind. Yeah, I mean, based on this, there were essentially somewhere between 42 and 54 districts that might have received more than us. We were really technically a little bit below 5%. I know the rounding makes it five. We were like four, seven, five. Um, and yeah, I, level services. I mean, I know we talked about, and we, we kind of all thought fiscal year 25 for a lot of reasons was going to be a tough year. And the state has even come out and they've had to make cuts because revenues were down from what's expected. Um, I'm optimistic. Um, hopefully, the discussions with the city will will help this a little bit. It's always tough being in this situation where we are barely above net school spending um, for what we are able to fund right now. Um, but at least what you're telling me is that we should be okay from a general operating perspective. And as you always mention, like we manage our budget well with whatever it is we're given. Yeah, I mean, as we've talked about several times, right? Like leading up to this moment was the time to make the point about how the, the negative impact of how chronically underfunded we are. Yeah. But now that we're here, I, I feel like that's not the right conversation to be having. Right now, we as a district have to put our focus into how do we make this work? Because now the, num the number is a real number, and there's nothing that any of us can do to change it. Right. And so what matters is how do we make that number work for kids? And you know, that's, what we're gonna, that's what our focus is on, and that's what we're going to deliver. You're coming here and saying we're not going to have an issue as we see it for 2025 in terms remain of hopeful. how we can pretend, you know, service our, our Yeah, I mean, there, again, there, there's some, some variables. And by the way, the, the legislature can step in and, and do more. They often do, but I, it's generally in the margin. So yeah. I'm not holding on to that hope. There's, there's a lot of things that play out. But um, at, a, at the basis level, there's reason to believe that um, we will be able to, to, to deliver on this, on this number. Thank you. Mr. Storrs? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just to summarize it, just to make sure that I'm reading it right, is if we get all of our leftover funding back, our surplus back, 
And if we are funded above net school spending as we're supposed to be based on past promises and all those other things, we just reach pretty close net school spending, which means we're going to be able to provide the same services that we are this year come next year. Is that a fair statement? If all of those assumptions yes. and everything bear, else out, bear, equal, bear out, right. we will be able to deliver the, the level service budget. Which is exactly right. What we're doing right now. I just want to get that. That would be above course. net school spending, though. Yep. Right. So that's net school spending. That is what we're doing now, again, next year with added costs and all that other stuff. Above. If either of those th two things don't happen, we don't get our surplus back, which I don't think would happen, and or we, we are not funded at that 1.6 above net school spending, then we have problems. Fair statement? It's a fair statement. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Mr. Bennett? <clears throat> um, the, the topic, I think you're wise from your perspective right now to say our focus has to be on this budget, right, because this is the hand we're dealt. But <clears throat> I'd like to think as as I talk to people on city council and as I make my way around the city as and constantly beat the drum for school spending um, because this has been this has been a, a huge topic since even before I was on since before I was on the school committee that the schools are chronically underfunded um, there's a perception that there's an endless appetite for dollars by the schools and um, be it real or, or not real, there, there's a perception out there that that is the case. So I'm, I'm curious when you talk about doing other things that we can't do other things, right? And it, it doesn't have to be now, it could be later, but I think it would be instructive for the general public to get an understanding of were we to be funded at either an adequate level or even just a little bit more than an adequate level from what I understand would be in the area of another 15 million or 20 million dollars. Right, but if we were funded by another five million or ten million, or what other things would, in general, not in not to the nickel, but in general terms, what kind of things would that money do? What kind of things could we do with that money that we're not doing now? I think it would be useful for people to get an understanding of were manna to come from heaven, what well, what would it buy? What kind of things could we do that we're not doing now? So the the good news is we do that annually, and. Uh, Produced it in December, and uh, uh, you know ha have that to the you know to the penny I, on exactly what we think. It, it, you know, I, again, I would say we're underfunded by 26 million dollars. Um, I don't think that this community is going to come up with 26 million dollars. So you know, we try to be realistic about like what do, forget what's fair. Um, what do we need to do the job that we're being asked to do? And that estimate comes in at, what did it was it this year? 11? 11 million. Yeah, so it was 11 million. Um, which, was which, people, which people scoff at, saying that that's, you know, talking about the, app, you know, the, the endless appetite, but it's not even half of what would make us average. Right. Um, and it's, again, reason, it's, it's, it's based on what the actual needs are, and it does exactly what you say. It specifies what we don't have here as a result of the fact, what students in Attleboro don't enjoy the benefits of that other places do, right? Kids in other communities have these things, and we don't have them because we don't have the resources to provide them. That's, that's listed out and, you know, um, made available as part of our, our budget presentation every year. Thank you. That was at that joint meeting? Yep. That was, okay, good. I'll, I'll dig that up. I appreciate it. Any other questions? I'll, I will say that uh, the the cherry sheet was a, a bit of a blow to us, especially because uh, for for the last year or so, we have known locally that this fiscal year was going to be difficult, um, and and we've grown over the last couple of years to become more reliant on state funding. So when that comes in a little lower than expected, um, that that certainly hurts us more than expected. Uh, but I do know uh, that. Representative Hawkins, Representative Scanlon, and Senator Feeney know the problem that this is for us and, and that uh, coming in lower than expected can hurt us. Um, and so I know that they are committed to seeing what they can do, as you said, when the, when the budget gets to, uh, gets to their process later on in the spring. So hopefully by the time we hear from you again in April, we'll have somewhat better news. But, um, but I also trust that 
as you said, we've been unfortunately experienced in in uh, pinching the pennies and making things work as best we can within the district with what we've got. So, um, so thank you for that. Excellent. Anything else? That from? concludes my report. Excellent. Thank you, Superintendent Sawyer. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to approve the minutes from our January 22nd meeting. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the, the resolution in support of the Cherish Act or a resolution in support of higher ed for all. Um, at our January 8th meeting, uh, one of the fac a faculty member from Bridgewater State University that lives in the community had asked us to uh, consider passing this resolution um, or passing a resolution. Uh, she following the meeting, she provided me with a uh, template resolution and some information from the Massachusetts Teachers Association, which I shared with all of you uh, shortly after. Um, uh, thank you to the administration to providing uh, some information related to our Attleboro Public Schools graduates uh, to put in uh, to make this more specific to our community. Um, so uh, I am, uh, because of my role at, at Bridgewater State, uh, I'm not planning to, uh, I'm planning to abstain from the vote on this resolution. Um, and I'm, uh, during discussion, I will not be providing any, uh, any opinion on that. Um, but uh, unless there's an objection from the, from the committee, uh, I will go ahead and, and facilitate the, the discussion and the vote. Are there any concerns? All right, uh, so I will entertain a motion to uh, pass the resolution in support of higher ed for all as presented. Moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion, any uh, thoughts? Mr. Storrs? So I, I, I support this, um, uh, this, this uh, resolution. Um, however, there were, there were a lot of things in the resolution that I would say are not student centric. Centric. It's it, you know gets a lot into teacher pay and things of that nature. Not that that's not related, um, but provided the funding would not take away from students, this is something I could definitely support because I see the value behind what they are trying to do. I appreciate that some effort was done to try to make it more Attleboro uh, focused. So that that's very much appreciated. Any other thoughts, Mr. Larson? Uh, I will not be supporting the, um, the resolution. As a member of the Attleboro School Committee, uh, it's my responsibility to uh, look out for the Attleboro Public Schools. Uh, this resolution, I think, just takes resources away from funds that could be supporting uh, the district. I think it earmarks money away from the basics that we are still struggling to cover. Um, and I think if the state has funds available, uh, they should be directing it to the needs of the pre-K through 12 plus programs uh, that we have here in the district. So for those reasons, I will not be supporting this resolution. Mr. Frappier? Sure. Uh, on the opposite side, as a member of the Attleboro School Committee and seeing that over a third of our students end up at a public institution in Massachusetts, and that a high school education that is the highest level we provide in Attleboro is no longer sufficient for competitive employment in this marketplace, I will be supporting this resolution as a worthy cause for our tax dollars to go to support people in the economy. Any other comments? Any other discussion? Seeing none, um, it, it because it uh, it does seem like there is some varied opinions. Uh, I'll actually do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Sawyer is a yes to approve. Uh, Mr. Frappier. No, yes, I'm asking a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, I misunderstood what you were saying. No, no, it's fine. Uh, so a yes is in support of the resolution, a no is uh, not in support of the resolution. Yes. Uh, Mr. Frappier. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Domenici. Yes. Uh, Mr. Larson. No. Mr. Storrs. Yes. Ms. Porto. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes. And Mr. Geddes will abstain. 
Uh, so the motion passes, seven to one, one. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is our consent agenda. Um, I, uh, I will entertain a motion to approve the following. Motion to accept a payment in the amount of $8.40 from Bay State Textiles to Hill Roberts Elementary. Motion to accept a donation in the amount of $103.82 from Chipotle to be deposited in the class of 2027 gifts donation account. Motion to accept an anonymous donation in the amount of $76.05, uh, which is the remaining balance in a student's lunch account to be used to pay off the lunch balance of a student in need. Motion to accept a donation in the amount of $4,000 from the J.S. Lim Foundation, $3,000 for uh, the 2024-2025 Attleboro High School Math and Science Prizes, and $1,000 to be used at the discretion of the principal. Motion to be, uh, excuse me, motion to approve an overnight international field trip proposal for Attleboro High School marketing students to attend the DECA state competition in Boston, Massachusetts, March 7th through 9th, 2024. And a motion to approve an overnight uh, international field trip proposal for 18 grade 9 through 12 students to attend the National High School Cheerleading Championships in Orlando, Florida on March 4th. Uh, running March 14th through 18th, 2024. Moved. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> motion passes <coughs> unanimously, thank you. Uh, next item is uh, a subcommittee update from our po policy and personnel uh, subcommittee that met on January 29th uh, at the start of that meeting. Uh, Mr. Storrs was elected uh, subcommittee chair, so I will turn it over to Mr. Storrs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yep, I would like to first thank my fellow committee members who elected me, uh, re-elected me as chair of the subcommittee. So um, the first item of our meeting um, was the student cell phone policy, which I know the members have um, already had some discussion about. Superintendent Sawyer attended the meeting. Uh, he gave us an update of where we are with the student cell phone policy. Um, so a lot of information. Um, I believe everyone's aware the superintendent, he's held uh, information sessions with both students and parents at this point. I think it's safe to say that there's some who accept the need for this policy and there's others who, I guess you could say, are less enthusiastic with it. Fair, fair statement? Fair statement. Okay. Um, one ask from some students um, to the superintendent was if we were to go forward with this, possibly giving them access to the high school's Wi-Fi, um, so that way when they do have the appropriate time to use their, their phone, they would have a better, um, better connection. So that's, that's part of the discussion, um, you know, part of the back and forth. Uh, the policy wording that was provided um, was very general in nature, um, and it explained the differences between the three different grade levels, the school levels. Um, discussion of other district policies was part, was held, um, and those districts seemed to write their policies with a lot more detail. So we, we did have a discussion about that. Um, for example, some districts, they use their policy, their policy covers all forms of electronic communication, including the watches, the laptops, iPads, things like that. Superintendent Sawyer indicated that he's looking to keep this policy right now focused on the cell phones because that is the primary problem. Uh, doesn't mean we'd have to you know, possibly revisit this in the future and, and, and edit it and add in these other things. But right now, he wants to keep it focused on where the problem is, which is those cell phones. Um, so the subcommittee asked the administration to look at some aspects of these other district policies, uh, also to write up the procedures, the procedure part of what would be um, associated with this policy once it's put into practice, and bring it back to the subcommittee so that we can fully understand uh, how this is all going to work out. Um, and the timeline would be to have this approved and go into effect before the start of the next school year. Superintendent, anything to add? That covers it. Good, good summary? Okay. All right, so uh, we're not moving on that now, but there will be more coming from the uh, administration on this soon. The subcommittee reviewed some of our Section D finance policies, our Section G J student policies, and our BEDH open forum guidelines policy. 
Uh, for the BEDH, uh, public comment at school committee meetings, we compared the Massachusetts Association of School Committee's policy and our policy, um, and there are some differences. But uh, we want to use what makes sense while maintaining what has worked for our, our, our district. So we're going to look at that, the policy itself again at our next meeting. Uh, but for the exhibit, we compared masks and our exhibit, which is the open forum guidelines exhibit. And we recommend keeping our exhibit and not going word for word what mask has because they have a lot of things that or a little extraneous, I guess is a good way to say it. So we did unanimously recommend minor edits that was provided in the packets to all the members, which includes uh, an added statement that the speaker is welcome to provide a copy of a written statement if one was used, um, and as well as adding in the time requirement that we're already using. So that's going to be added into the exhibit, or at least that's what's been voted out of the subcommittee to the full committee. So. With that, um, I will put, uh, it, this was all voted out unanimously, so I'm going to put exhibit BEDH E1 open form guidelines um, exhibit um, onto the table to uh, up for discussion. Uh, it was provided in the packet. Is there any discussion on exhibit E1 for policy BEDH? Yes, please. Sure. Uh, so not to be pedantic, which I, I hate to do, but we have the welcoming statement that we're saying each open form participant will be given three minutes to address the committee. But in the open forum guidelines, we are saying the chairperson may establish a time limit. Are we looking to memorialize a permanent time limit? If so, shall we change that may to a should or shall? It's more about following the rules like as it's laid out, because if we're announcing there is one, that is not up to the discretion of the chair if we're following this policy about verbatim. Yeah, let's take a look here. So you're, you're talking BEDH. So yeah, the first one. Uh, BEDHE1, the yellow highlighted field about the time limit that we have used for at least two years and we're looking to move forward with. Yep. We are saying that they will be given this, but in the open forum guidelines, we say chair may establish. So the guidelines will now say each open forum participant will be given three minutes to address the committee. So fourth bullet point down, the chairperson may establish a time limit for each speaker according to policy. Do we want to strike that is, I guess, where I'm trying to get. I, I mean, that's something we can we can discuss right now. I mean, possibly giving the chairperson that leeway might not be a bad thing because there are going to be times where there could be a big group and um, the chairperson could have that leeway, that flexibility. Generally, the first statement is what we would rely on and, and what's that is what we have been doing. And we are going to, again, uh, the committee is going to look at the policy itself and we could be a little bit more uh, specific in that. If, if we but it, I mean... I would imagine um, we could be open to the idea of removing bullet number four right now, which is the chairperson may establish a timeline for each speaker according to the policy. There is already the time limit that we're recommending up at the top in the end of the first paragraph. So, so. I would, sorry, I'll phrase it. I would suggest the inverse that we shouldn't be announcing the time limit as part of the speech if we are going to do a shall after it, because then it allows flexibility for after that statement. So if, like you said, if we have a large number, we want to reduce it to one minute, announcing it at three minutes at the beginning if we're following our policies, that's where we could get hung out to dry, I feel. If we are going against it, we can say shall set a policy and rather than have it in the, the welcoming statement is my suggestion. I think it, ha it hamstrings us more than it has to. Yeah, to, from my point mm -hmm. um, and, and from the discussions that we had, I, I believe that the three minutes, I think it's safe to say it's proven itself effective in the past, say, six months to a year. So... Having the statement that, you know, hey, it's normally three minutes, but then also giving the chairperson flexibility in the case that you just said, like if all of a sudden we had 100 people show up and it was two in the morning, we might be looking to have the chairperson be able to kind of rein that in a little bit. So I think my, my opinion is having that flexibility of that fourth bullet point of the chairperson may establish the time limit. I think that that keeps us within the confines of the policy so we can say three minutes normally but it also gives the chairs flexibility. That, that's that's my point of view. But anybody else have any comments, Rob? So I'll, I will say I, I appreciate Mr. Frappier's point, and I know that um, in in looking at the mask policy and and uh, knowing that what some <laughs> other districts some other districts will just cap open forum at this many minutes, regardless of how many people are speaking or or what uh, an individual's time limit may be. Um, so I I. I I think I would prefer to, to keep it at uh, three minutes because I do think uh, uh, many folks that come to address the committee come prepared and I think three minutes is 
been a, an understood guideline for the uh, for the last few months. Um, and so uh, keeping it at that time limit allows them to get everything that they want to share with the committee um, out into the into the public record. Um, so perhaps changing, uh, but I, I, I also appreciate it, uh, and agree with Mr. Frappier's point that the fourth bullet somewhat contradicts the opening statement. So um, to provide that flexibility, maybe it's just a matter of uh, amending bullet four to say that the chairperson may establish a different time limit for each speaker according to policy. Sorry. Yep, thank to you. Clarify, Mr. Trump, yep. I'm a thousand percent okay with three minutes being the default. I'm saying announcing it in the open, the only thing I would recommend striking is a highlighted yellow in the statement. That's what I think gets us into trouble. And also, I would not change the time limit during a meeting. I think that is a while, that's a can of worms to talk about. If we say three minutes for you, but 30 seconds for you, that is not oh, no, a no, no. discussion. I was more saying, like, at the start of open yeah, forum, yeah, saying one minute for everyone, but even though they prepared for three. That's, that's what I yeah, also, that's what You'll be next, Scott. So what Mr. Geddes is talking about there is also that some school committees, what they do is they say, okay, open forum is open for the next half hour. Mm -hmm. And then if there's people who have not gotten a chance to speak who want to, and we hit that, and they hit that half hour, they end open forum, which is not what we want to do as a committee. We want to hear from our constituents. We want to hear about those who, who you know, want to be heard. So um, I hear what you're saying. So if we were to rem uh, move, not remove, but move the, the given three minutes to address the committee into the same bullet um, as the chairperson may establish. So it now would read, each open forum participant will be given up to three minutes to address the committee. Um, and then something along the lines of the chairperson may establish a different time limit for each speaker according to policy, depending on, you know, something like that. Would that solve the problem or would that meet the needs of everybody? If, it, if you're asking me directly, I think we should remove the whole line because I think it, it unnecessarily encumbers us from allowing that per meeting. But you're that, saying remove the three minutes? The whole line. Well, I am I fine am. with the time limit. I, mean, I think writing this down in a policy and then going against the policy at a meeting is going to open us up to fun discussions from constituents and for people that want to participate and exercise their free speech. I'm saying we remove it from the statement that Rob, that Chairman Geddes is going to read at each meeting yep. while still leaving it as a bullet that he may set. So just move it down to a bullet as a separate bullet. No, no, strike it. I'm saying strike it because I think it's an example. It is not, if we put something in the guidelines, if you say, hey, you're eligible for a loaner car, until we say otherwise, when you go to the car dealership, you're going to ask for the loaner car. So, so memorializing three minutes. Yep. Let me ask you this. So let's say that we got rid of the three minutes and now somebody gets up there and they want to speak for 20 minutes. Can we stop them? We can, because Rob, Chairman Geddes can set a time limit at the beginning of it. I'm saying remove it from the statement that he will read each time. That is my only suggestion. And, and, and I do want to say this. Masks policy does have that three minute requirement. So that's where this came from. So. And, and I don't think Mr. Frappier is suggesting we eliminate the time limit. He's just, just eliminating just saying, it in writing. Just eliminating the writing from the, the statement from the. Because yeah. then we'd still be able to follow statement. our rules afterwards without having this on policy that encumbers us from discussions after the meeting. Mr. Domenici. Thank you. I don't hate the idea of having that in a welcoming statement. Uh, in particular, if you're not here, it, it, I have to read it, or you know, somebody else would have to read it if I'm not here. Just get rid of the three. Just put an underline. Each open forum participant will be given blank minutes to address the committee, and knowing that he's going to say three every time, but it's not specifying three, but it's part of the opening statement. Just not a number. And then our fourth bullet point allows Rob to have the discretion so that every meeting he could change it. Three minutes this time around. Five minutes next time around. It just, just, just get rid of the three. Okay. And, and you know, leave it leave it blank. And Rob, you know you're going to say three. And then I, th I think that takes gets rid of the conflicting language. Okay. So we do have a lot to go through. So let's see if I can try to wrap this one up pretty good. If there's no other suggestions, I would entertain a motion to amend the original motion so that the last sentence in the first paragraph would now read for each open forum participant will be given blank minutes to address the committee. I would look for an amendment to that. Okay. Moved. Second. Okay, we have an amendment and a second. Is there any further discussion on the amendment only? Seeing none, uh, that amendment will, uh, I will now vote on that amendment. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, nay. we, <laughs> nay, yep. All right, so that passes uh, eight to one. That amendment is now in place. And now the new um, 
the motion is uh, that this policy has been recommended to the full committee with the minor change that we just made. Is there any further discussion regarding that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes. Thank you. Not bad. Okay. You know, we have like another hundred to go here, so that was... <laughs> <laughs> All right, where was I? All right, we, that was policy B E D D H E one. Beautiful. All right, the following policies and exhibits were reviewed with the recommendation of no changes as the policies either align with masks, which we always try to do, or continues to meet our process. Uh, policy DJE procurement requirements, DB equal educational opportunities, JC attendance areas, JEB elementary entrance age, JF residency policy, JFA enrollment of children of non-resident staff, JFAA Attleboro High School CTE program admission policy, JFABC admission of transfer students, JIB student involvement in decision making, JICA student dress code, JICC student conduct on buses, JICFA-E1, hazing, JICFB, bullying prevention, JICH, alcohol, tobacco, and drug use by students prohibited, JIE, pregnant students, JJH, student late night or overnight travel, JJHR1, student travel regulations, JJIF, head injury and concussion policy, JRA, student records, and JRD, student photographs. Um, all of these policies were voted out unanimously with the recommendation to note the review date. Um, I'm going to put those motions up to um, a vote all at once, unless somebody would look wants to take any of them up separately. Seeing none, um, is there any further discussion on noting the review date for all of these policies? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we will note the review date for all of those. <coughs> Great, moving on down. The following exhibits were, uh, uh, were reviewed with the recommendation of removing them from the policy binder as the process no longer uses hard copy forms. JCA-E1, request for change of student school assignment, and JFA-E1, application for the enrollment of children of non-resident staff. So those were voted out unanimously. Um, does anybody want me to take either one of them up separately? Seeing none, I'll put those up for a uh, discussion. Any discussion regarding these exhibits? Yes, please. Uh, was there any particular reason given for deciding to remove both of them? Yeah, uh, I'll try to summarize and make sure I'm right. So effectively, these are all done online now instead of using the hard copy forms that we've used in the past. That's true. We usually receive an email from the individual that's requesting this. Um, and if we need a hard copy, we can definitely email it to them. Right. And these exhibits were forms effectively all right any other discussion seeing none all those in favor aye. aye any opposed we will remove those two exhibits moving on down all right the following policies and exhibits were reviewed with the recommendation of edits mostly minor in nature to fully align with massachusetts association of school committees jbb educational equity jca assignment of students students to schools JFABF, Educational Opportunities for Children in Foster Care, JHD, Exclusions and Exemption from School Attendance, JICFA, pro pro Prohibition of Hazing, JIH, Searches and Interrogations, JJ, Co-Curricular and Extracurricular Activities, JJA, Student Organizations, JJE, Student Fund Raising Activities, and JLCB, Immunization of Students. Uh, these were all voted out unanimously to make the edits that were provided to the members in the meeting packet. Does anybody want me to take any of these up separately? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll put these up for discussion. Any discussion on the edits that were provided? Yes, sir. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We will pass those edits, make those edits. <coughs> Next, the following exhibit was reviewed with a recommendation of some edits to meet the current process. Uh, JF-E1, proof of residency. Uh, the exhibit was provided within the packet to the members. Is there, uh, I'll put this up for discussion. Any discussion regarding the changes to JF-E1? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we will pass that. Moving on down. The following policies were reviewed with the recommendation of edits to align with the business office protocol. DBG, budget adoption and pro procedures. DGA, authorized signatures. 
DIE audits and DJ purchasing. These were all voted out unanimously to make the edits as provided to the members in the meeting packet. Does anybody want me to take either of these up separately? Seeing none, I'll put this up for discussion. Any discussion re regarding these edits? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Moving on down. The following exhibit was recommended to be reinstated uh, with the provided minor edits. This is a uh, exhibit we used to have. We voted uh, out a couple of years ago, and uh, Mark, um, our business manager, would like us to bring it back in with some minor edits. Um, policy exhibit DGA-E1, authorized signatures, payrolls, and warrants. Um, this was voted out unanimously and provided to the members within the packet. Is I'll put this up for discussion. Any discussion with, regarding this exhibit? Yes. I'm trying to remember what was what was the reasoning for taking it out because it was three years ago, right? That we uh, that sounds that, about right. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but three years ago sounds about right. Um, so I guess was there any particular change of heart as to why why we pulled it out a few years ago and are looking it, to go back to it now, or did Ms. or did Mr. Portado provide any reason? I think it would, it we were looking at it more like a procedure than it was, right, policy? I agree, yes. Because this is more about like, you know, if it's up to this amount, it's these people have to sign. If it's this between this and this, it's those people between this and this, those people, and so on. And I think that we were relying on it being more of a procedure. And now Mark, you know, our business manager feels that it should be in policy. Fair enough? Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we'll bring this guy back. Moving on down. The following policy were reviewed with the recommendation of edits, mostly minor in nature, to fully align with MASK. JFABD, Homeless Students Enrollment Rights and Services. JFABE, Educational Opportunities for Military Children. JICF, Gang Activity Slash Secret Societies. JJF, Student Activity Accounts. JKAA, Physical Restraint Policy and Procedures. JLC, Student Health Services and Requirements, JLCA, Physical Examination of Students, JLCC, Communicable Diseases, JACD, Administering Medicines to Students, and JQ, Student Fees, Fines, and Charges. All of these were voted out unanimously to make the edits as provided to the members in the meeting packet. Does anybody want me to take any of these up separately? Seeing none, I'll put this up for discussion. Any discussion on these? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> All right. We will make those edits. The following job descriptions. We're out of the policy stuff and uh, into job descriptions. The following job descriptions were presented by the administration and voted out by the subcommittee unanimously. Content coordinator, educational technology coach, mindfulness coach. Um, these job descriptions were provided to the members uh, in the meeting packet. Does anybody want me to take any of them up separately? Seeing none, I'll put these up for discussion. So these are to approve these job descriptions as provided. Is there any discussion? Yes. Now just in general, is there at least one or more people in each of these roles uh, today? Yes. Okay. Yeah, these are already filled positions, yep. So it's just we're, we're um, finalizing what the job is, and that, that was actually worked on with the person and their, their manager and, and what have you. So, okay. Yep. okay, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. We approve those three job descriptions. And lastly, we performed our two-year uh, required by law review of the bullying prevention and intervention plan. There were some minor edits uh, provided by the administration. Uh, the edits were voted out unanimously, and the plan was provided to the members within the packet. I'll put this up for discussion. Is there any discussion regarding the minor edits to the bullying prevention and intervention plan? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The updates to the Bullying Prevention and Intervention Plan are approved. And that, Mr. Chairman, concludes my report. Uh, that was not an enviable subcommittee meeting agenda but I, <laughs> when I saw that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Storrs, and thank you, Policy Subcommittee, for your, uh, for your continued review of all of the policies to make sure that they are, uh, that they are up to date. Um, Next item on the agenda is open forum. Uh, open forum is a time when members of the public may address the school committee. Open forum is not a time for the committee members to engage in dialogue with members of the public. 
Guidelines for Open Forum are available to you. Please know that we are interested in what you have to say, but we cannot respond without background information on your issue. Uh, is there anyone here that would like to address the committee? Seeing none, I will close Open Forum. How much time would they have gotten if there was? <laughs> <laughs> Depends how many of them were going to show up. Uh, so our next full committee meeting is uh, Monday, February 26th, uh, which is the first Monday after April vacation. Um, February vacation. <laughs> sorry, what did, what did I say? We were jumping ahead to April. Sorry, my bad. Uh, February vacation. I'm looking forward to spring. Yes. Unlike the groundhog. Uh, <laughs> Uh, between now and then, uh, this Wednesday, we have our Finance and Budget Subcommittee meeting at 6.30 uh, here at uh, the Zito Conference Room. Uh, next Monday, February 12th at 6.30 at Coelho Middle School, our Infrastructure and Facilities Subcommittee meeting. Uh, reminder that February vacation is the week of February 29th, and on February 21st of uh, that Wednesday, uh, I mentioned this at our last meeting, the Attleboro Council on Human Rights uh, is uh, hosting a Black History Month celebration from 5 to 7 p.m. at the Attleboro Arts Museum. And uh, anyone interested in attending should uh, send an email to attleborohumanrights at gmail.com to uh, reserve a spot. Um, any other updates or new business for the committee? Seeing none, oh, I oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> hey, one. I wanted to, to say thank you to the Attleboro High School Student Council for putting together the Kids Night Out registration. Uh, and this is an event which I heard about through the Thatcher Panda, Pro, Panda Press this week, where Saturday, February 10th from 5 to 9 p.m., kids between 4 and 11 will be able to be babysat by different high school students uh, at the school. Uh, there is a cost involved, but I think it's great and it really puts Attleboro High School at the center of the community. And I look forward to more events where you guys, the students, are able to reach out to the community like that. So thank you to the Student Council and Principal Campbell for allowing that to happen. Just in time for Valentine's Day plans. <laughs> Excellent. Any other uh, items? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Have a great night.